So we're in Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 19 through 27. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 27. And what it speaks about here is the future glory that we have in Jesus Christ. So what we'll do is we'll read verses 19 through 27, but I'm going to actually use verse 18 as the launching point, giving you some background encouragement in that, and then moving on through the passage. But we will begin reading at verse 19, though I do plan on incorporating verse 18. Let's begin at verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only they, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so we're going to be looking at our future glory in Christ, but as we are about to embark on that, we need to remember what he had just said in verse 18. Let me use that as a, as a context and develop that as we move to the uh, verses following. But in verse 18... He had said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So notice how he says he considers the sufferings to be something that is minimal. These sufferings are something that he's enduring that really are minimal because he's comparing it to something else. He's comparing it to the glory that is to be had in Jesus Christ. And when it comes to somebody who could give a tremendous amount of testimony related to to suffering, the Apostle Paul is one who could do so. When Paul was on the road to Damascus and the Lord Jesus Christ confronted him there and Paul had his amazing conversion experience. Paul had lost his sight for a while and, and uh, God began speaking to a man by the name of Ananias and said to this man named Ananias that, that Paul was going to come to him and that Ananias was being instructed to pray for Paul and even though Ananias, <clears throat> Ananias felt it was important for him to, to pretty, pretty much give God some information concerning Saul, uh, God gave to Ananias directions that he's to pray. He's to pray for Saul. And, and as he was saying that to him, it's found in Acts 9, 15 and 16. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Go pray for him. He's chosen. He's going to bear my word. He's going to be a testimony. He's going to evangelize. But he is also going to suffer. So right from the beginning in the life of the Apostle Paul, right from his conversion, God was making it clear that this man would suffer persecution. When Paul began to speak concerning the things that he went through for the gospel's sake, and he was writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he made it very clear to them that he had endured great suffering. It's found in verses 24 through 28 in 2 Corinthians 11, where he says, From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often, in cold and nakedness, Besides the other things, 
what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul could speak with some understanding concerning suffering. And yet I want you to see something, how he had said in verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I consider. That means I've weighed this through. I've thought it out. And as I've compared one thing with the other, I believe the glory far surpasses any suffering. And so he had what is called an eternal framework. He, he knew that he was just passing through. He knew that he was a pilgrim, a sojourner. He knew that he was appointed unto suffering and affliction. He knew that. And with that in mind, he saw those as simply bumps in the road on his journey to heaven. Paul had counted the cost, and he decided that the pursuit of the Lord was the number one thing, no matter what might confront him, no matter what he might go through. And so he is speaking concerning that in verse 18, when he said, there's glory that shall be revealed. And then in verse 19, he goes on to begin to describe that. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And so Paul says that creation, man, and the Holy Spirit all groan. He says that in verse 22, 23, and 26. When he speaks about this, the word groan is an expression of anguish, revealing a state that is painfully unsatisfying and sorrowful. It's a cry. It's a cry for deliverance. It's a cry for deliverance, and creation cries for deliverance because sin has affected everything. Sin has affected everything. And so creation is presented as being, notice, in an earnest expectation. It, literally, it speaks of creation standing on the tiptoes with expectancy. Nature itself is presented as waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Now, when he speaks concerning creation, uh, it's important to note that he's speaking about a variety of things that does not include does not include Satan. Because sometimes people have asked me this question, so I thought I might want to answer it very quickly. Sometimes people have asked, is it possible for Satan to be saved? And the answer to that is no. The Bible makes it very clear that he has a final destiny, and there's no way that he's ever going to repent of what he's done. None of his demons that have broken uh, with the Lord and followed him are going to be redeemed. They all are forever going to be um, brought into, into punishment, eternal punishment punishment. Satan is not being uh, included, in other words, in creation when creation is spoken of here as being in earnest expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. You see, the idea of God completing his plan of redemption is not pleasing to Satan, and it is not pleasing to demons. The Bible makes it very clear that Satan opposes God in every way that he can, and he doesn't want you glorified. He doesn't want creation to be, to be redone. He doesn't want new heavens and new earth. He doesn't want any of that. He opposes anything that God wants to do. He's an, an enemy. Sometimes people look at Satan as if he's like he's something that, that should be followed because he promises so many things to us and all. And, and the problem is, is that he hates you and he wants to destroy you. And the Bible makes it very clear that that is so. Now, there are some who would say, well, there really isn't a Satan. I mean, there's quite a number of people who would go so far as to say he's simply a character or he's a portrayal of evil, but he's not a real being. C.S. Lewis once said something that I think is worthy of quoting in this context. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or magician with the same delight. The Bible makes it very clear that there is a personal devil and that he is opposed to God fulfilling his plan of complete redemption. You see that very clearly when Jesus was tempted by the enemy as it's recorded in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4. 
Now, the Bible speaks concerning the fact that Jesus, after his baptism, went into the wilderness and was there for 40 days, and that he fasted for 40 days. And finally, after the 40 days had been completed, the Scripture says that he was hungry. He was literally famished. He was about to die of starvation. And at that point, when he was at his weakest physically, the enemy comes and begins to tempt him. And the enemy, because Jesus is there around all of these small stones and all... The enemy, looking at the stones and speaking to Jesus and knowing that Jesus is hungry, says, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you make these stones into bread? You have the ability to do so. Why don't you satisfy a physical need with your miraculous power? Make these stones into bread. When you look at the, at the stones and you go into Israel and you see the bread, you can see that these small stones could look like freshly baked loaves of bread. Jesus is starving. But Jesus speaking to him said, man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, after he says that to him and he quotes scripture to him, the devil takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and he says to him, why don't you cast yourself down from up here? He says, because Malachi had stated that the messenger whom you seek will come suddenly to the temple and what could be more sudden than you coming at the speed of gravity and then being held up because the scripture says he shall give his angels charge concerning you and they shall lift you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. In other words, Jesus, you want to quote scripture and you say it is written, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, then Satan oppresses him and opposes him by saying, then why don't you just cast yourself down? And I can quote scripture just like you, except he misquoted scripture because the scripture he quotes includes the phrase uh, to keep thee in all thy ways and that's why the Lord Jesus Christ responds by saying it is written you're not to put the Lord thy God to the test and once again using scripture overcomes a temptation finally the devil takes him to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time and he says all of this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I want and I'll give it to you you don't have to go to the cross to to, to become the king of the world, I'll simply give it to you. But I'm going to require just one thing. Why don't you bow down and worship me? And the Lord Jesus responded to him, it's written, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, whatever you worship, you will serve. Whatever it may be that is the number one thing in your, in your life. And, and, and by the way, I mean, when we think about idolatry, very often we think of statues or graven images of some sort. We think of elephant gods and you name it. There's so many different carvings of different kinds of gods. Whatever it is that replaces God in your worship system is your idol. It's your idol. It doesn't even have to be a statue. It can be a person. It can be a goal. It, it can be so many different things. But whatever is the number one love of your life that really, in essence, is your God. Even the atheist has a God. He, he worships himself, worships his own philosophy, you see? And so Jesus said, no. It is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Get, get thee behind me. Go away. And so Jesus deals with him. Satan's intent was to undermine God's plan of redemption. And Jesus overcame Satan. And Jesus won our salvation when he went to that cross and he died on the cross. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And the cost of redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ as he poured it out that he might save us. So Paul is speaking concerning creation. The non-rational creation, speaking of animals and plant life, rivers, streams, clouds, rocks, etc. And he's saying that creation groans in earnest expectation for the revelation of God's sons. So this promise of a new creation. This is something found both in the Old and the New Testaments. Isaiah 65, 17 says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So God says there's going to be a new creation, and creation is groaning for that day. It eagerly longs, notice, for the revelation or the revealing of the sons of God. Nature is desiring the uncovering or the unveiling of God's children. One day, real believers will be shown. One day, 
they will be completely distinguishable from the world. One day they will be revealed completely. Even in our day, there are some who can look very much like a genuine Christian. They do things that Christians do. They get up in the morning on a Sunday. They drive out of their neighborhood. They go to a church service. They may even serve there. And you know, they attend, they sing songs, they raise their hands in proper time during worship, they get involved. There are quite a number of people who, who believe because they got up and went to church that they must be Christians. Before I got saved, if you'd have spoken to me and said to me, what is your faith, what are you? I'd have said, I'm a Christian. But I wasn't saved, I wasn't following God. I didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And there's many in this room would say the same thing. I thought I was a Christian, but I was never born again. I never had committed myself to Christ. I never had received his spirit to dwell within me. I never had asked for forgiveness of sins to be cleansed that I might become the temple of the spirit of God. None of that ever happened. And there are quite a number of people like that. And even to this day, there are people who are indistinguishable. They sit in church. They act like believers. They do the same thing other believers do or real believers do. And they are, they are not really to be distinguished. It's interesting that that happens. And uh, Jesus even spoke concerning that when he gave a, a parable of the wheat and tares and the wheat and the tares grew up together alongside Matthew 13. They grew up alongside one another. And the wheat and the tare, the tare is a weed. The weed doesn't even show that it's a weed until it's mature. And there it is all along just amongst the wheat. And people finally discovered there are, there are tares amongst the wheat. And then the question is asked, should we go and should we remove them? And the response is no, because if you pull up the tear, you're going to possibly harm the genuine. Just leave it to grow, and ultimately the reapers will come. They'll take care of all of this, and then the true will be distinguished from the false. That's why it's so very important for us to know whether we're the true or we're the false. Do we have a relationship with Christ or do we not? If I stood before the Lord in judgment and were he to ask a question like, why should I allow you into my kingdom? What would my answer be? Would it be because my mom took me when I was six months old and had me baptized? Or would it be because I went through certain religious classes, attended church? What would it be? Because the only answer that, the God, that our God receives is because I trusted you in salvation by receiving the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I was born again. I became the temple of the Spirit of God. The reason I enter into heaven is not by works of righteousness, which I've done, but according to your mercy, you saved me. And that's how we enter in, and that's how we're distinguished from the falls. So the revealing of the sons of God occurs, but it'll occur when Jesus returns to planet Earth. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says in verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So notice how he says creation was subjected, and it's by God that it was subjected to futility. That word futility simply means a rendered unable to succeed. It's unable to achieve a goal or a purpose. When was it subjected to futility? At the fall. When God was speaking to Adam and he said in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. God goes on to say, curse it is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. Dust you are, dust you shall return. So God says, because you heeded the voice of your wife. That's why I never listen to Marie, no matter what she says. It's, it's right here in the Bible. No group, no organization, no government agency will ever stem the tide of corruption. There are some making valiant, good efforts, but no plan, as we know, will ever completely succeed. Disease and pollution, decay and disaster will continue and will increase over time. It's interesting that in our day, some are crying back to nature as if nature is friendly. Nature isn't friendly. Just watch the news. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, floods, fires, and yet we're going back to nature. 
Now, we don't worship nature. We worship the God of nature. And God intends to do a new work and recreate to make a new heaven and a new earth. But it's God who does it. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. So we don't worship creation. We worship the creator. But according to verse 21, the creation itself will be delivered. Nature itself will be delivered from this curse. That curse is called the bondage of corruption. And we know what he means. If you don't water your lawn, it's going to die. If you plant vegetables, insects and gophers will come and eat them. If you plant trees, they die. Your ground gets infested with weeds. That's the truth. We know that. No matter what you do to take care of the nature, it, it is all subject to corruption. I've only had, I've said this before. Some of you haven't heard me say it. It comes to mind. I, everything I touch, I, I, I kill. You know, I, that's just the way it is. I'll go plant a flower and, you know, poor little thing. I mean, it's like they, they, they don't do well with me. Uh, I had a friend of mine one time said, you know, you have some nice uh, plants here. He says, how would you select them? I said, they're the ones that live. <laughs> the other ones died, you know, and that's, that's how that works. But I did have one plant. I've shared this before. I had one plant. It, we had bought a house, and we moved into the house. I went into the backyard, and they had forgotten some ivy. And ivy is pretty hardy. You know, it's real difficult to kill ivy. And it was in a little pot there on, on the patio, and and so I took to watering it. You know, every week I was watering it, making sure it remained green. And it did. I mean, that thing remained green for a long time. And then one day it hit me. I hadn't watered this little ivy plant for a long time. And I, I felt bad. So I, I went out and I, I, I looked at it. Uh, there it is. And it's still green. And it's just nice. And, and I'm looking at this. And I've been watering this for a year. And I thought, man, you know, and I, I forgot to water it for several weeks. And yet it's still green. And, you know, I got kind of weird, I have to admit it. And, and I'm looking at it. I said, man, you're a good plant. You're a good little plant. And I talked to it, you know. And it says, right on, bro. No, I, I said, you're, you're a good little plant, man. And I reached down and I tapped it like it was plastic. The only thing that I ever had that stayed green. I kill it all. I kill it all. That's the truth. I'm not lying. That's the truth. It was plastic. So everything dies. Everything gets weeds. You know, gophers consume. That's just the way it is. A neighbor decides to let their dog use your lawn as their bathroom and I mean, that's what happens, you know, and, and that's the point he's making. But it's going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The curse one day will be lifted. Second Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He says in verse 22, The whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. All nature is longing for redemption, longing to be made new is the picture. He speaks of laboring and birth pangs. And he's saying it's not pointless. It actually will bring forth fruit. In other words, there's a day coming when God who subjected this to futility will remove that curse and will recreate the heavens and the earth. Now, he goes on in verse 23 to say, and not only they, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Our bodies will be redeemed. One of these days, these bodies that are breaking down. You know, you're young right now. Bless God. You're young right now. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you say to your feet, feet move. And they do. You say, pick this up, and you don't even have to think about it. You just pick it up and all of that. Well, eventually what happens is your body begins to break down. Your mind always thinks you're young. Your body reminds you that you're really not. You know, that's just the way it is. And then you get some delusion about how great you used to be when you were young, and you're always better when you were young than you really actually were. You know, I could run a mile in, I think it was 257 or something like that. You know, I could bench press 9,000 pounds. You know, you just think that way, but it's always been a lie. It's part of the delusion of your old mind. You know, you get up in the morning now and, and you start saying, should I take the chance of 
trying to jump this great distance. It's got to be two feet, you know. I, I'll be in my backyard. I'll be on, I have a retaining wall that's three feet, and I'll stand on it, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if I should take the chance of jumping. I used to be a paratrooper, and I'm, I'm standing there going, that's three feet. I roll and get up after 20 minutes. <laughs> One day, our bodies will be just absolutely in perfect condition. No more gym time. No more Pilates. No more agony. And one size fits all in heaven, too. So you won't even have to go to the bargain thing, you know. It'll be great. One of these days, and as you look at that and think about that, we ourselves within are just desiring that moment that we'll be with the Lord. You see, we have, notice, he says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. That first fruits is a foretaste of the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit who lives within you causes you to long to be with Jesus Christ. There's a special time of worship, we'll say. And it's just, it just was anointed, and, and you sense it. And, and, and there are times that as you're worshiping God and singing praise to him, that you get lost up in it. You get lost in it, and you, and you just say within yourself, I would like to stay here for much longer because I, I sense the presence of God, and I'm enjoying this. You see, worship is literally speaking of giving to God that which he is worthy of. The word worship is really a, a word that was worthy ship. And worthy ship has been just broken down to the single word worship. Worship comes from, there's a variety of words you could use, but one is from the Greek word proskaneo. If you look behind me and you see this black um, cloth right here, and you read the top, it says lagos proskuneo. I had somebody today asking me, what is that up there? Why do you have that up there? I said, I just thought it was time for a change for a while. But he said, but what's it mean? I said, those are Greek words. And he says, well, what do they mean? I said, well, our four pillars in our ministry, the word worship, proskoneo, that's what that word is. Proskoneo speaks of planting yourself towards something. But it can be spoken of in terms of your worship. And proskoneo could be a word that has a deep, intimate sense to it. But there are those who have said that the word worship can also be described as kissing the face of God, of kissing the face of God. Have you ever thought of it that way? That, that when we start our church services with songs, it's not intended just to fill in some time before I come up to share, but that what we're doing is preparing our hearts by, by coming forward to him, placing ourselves in front of him, and saying, speak, Lord, as we speak to him, as we sing to him, we are, we are giving to him what he is worthy of. And by the way, when you do that, he speaks to your heart through his word and by his spirit. That's why we have singing, by the way. That's why we prepare our hearts by worship. We give to him that which he deserves, our hearts and our worship, right? That's worship. And you're kissing his face. My, my granddaughter, Stella, is 10 months old, and she's learning to kiss me. And, and so I'll say, I'll say, Stella, give Papa kisses. And she, she oh, uh, she just starts to, she grabs hold of me, and she pushes her little face on mine, and she kisses, oh, I'm in heaven. I'm in, and then Marie will come, my wife will come, and say, give Grandma kisses, and Stella will look at Marie and will push her away. <laughs> I feel so sorry for Marie. <laughs> Marie says, another one bites the dust. Another one. Because all of my grandchildren have been like that. There's just something about it. I don't know. But she kisses me, and I'll hold her. And, and those of you who are parents, or those of you who have great love for a niece or whatever, a, a grandparent, you know what I'm trying to say. There's just a connection there that is unbelievable. It's just this moment like, oh, it is so rich and it is so joyful. It is so peaceful. It is so good. I don't want it to end. 
worship, worshiping God. And we groan because we want that, the contentment that God can give you sometimes. In the midst of a storm, his presence is with you, the peace that he can bring, the joy, the love. These are only foretaste, by the way. That's what he's saying, the first fruit of the Spirit. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who gives you that sense of closeness to God. It's the Holy Spirit who draws you into that close communion with him. It's the Holy Spirit who works in that way. And it's the Holy Spirit who causes us to long to be with Jesus himself, to be out of here that I might be over there, to be with him. Not in this great escape mode where I just got to get out of this place. It's such a, a cesspool and I'm out of here. I want. No, it's, it's a matter of I have a longing to be with him because to be with him is far better. We groan. We can grieve over our own situation, desiring to be with Jesus, to be freed from this world. But we eagerly await. We eagerly await being with him. In 2 Corinthians 5, 4, it says, For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He says in verse 23, and not only they, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. At the moment, our bodies are yet to be glorified, but in the future, indeed, they shall be. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54 says it like this, this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He says in verse 24, for we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we're saved, according to verse 24, in this hope. That word hope is confident expectation. We are saved in this hope, this confident expectation that he who has begun a good work in us will continue and complete it in the day of Jesus Christ that God is going to continue working. He says in verse 25, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We wait patiently. We endure all that we go through with a simple knowledge. And this is important, the simple knowledge of knowing this is worth it. No matter what, it takes a certain degree of experience and maturity in the Lord to grow to that point. As a young believer, I was constantly mad at God because things weren't going my way. Things weren't going my way. I would do one thing, and it just didn't seem to be fruitful. I would ask for something. I didn't seem to get it. I started getting mad at the Lord. And I used to blame God all the time. I was, I'd, I'd actually literally get angry at him. And I would tell him, I'm angry at you. How come? Why didn't you? Allow? And I would talk to the father like that. One day I went to get my hair cut. I was going back to Biola and went to get my hair cut. Actually, I was going to Biola. I had to get my hair cut because they had haircut regulations at that time. And so I was going to college. So I went to this place where I'd gotten my hair cut before. And I had a motorcycle. I had a Harley. And I was driving it. And I went to the place to get my hair cut. And I, got, I told the guy how I wanted it cut. And then he just messed my hair up really bad he 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 made it look like a like a helmet you know it's like round and i was really angry and i rode my bike home and i went into the bathroom i washed it out and my hair was like an inch and a half you know and i tried to comb it and it would just stand and i looked you know like woodstock that little bird and peanuts Charlie Brown and so I, I just oh I got on my bike and I started to drive out the driveway and now I'm yelling at God 
I'm, I'm, I'm raising my voice at him. I'm saying, I can't even get a stupid haircut. Just a stupid haircut. Why didn't you? And I hit the corner, took a right, and my bike went out from underneath me. I hit the ground, and the bike spun around. All the traffic stops. I have to get up and drag my bike off the side of the road. And I heard the voice of the Lord when he said, don't yell at me. I'm not kidding. Don't yell at me. You blame me too much. That, that, this is a true story. I actually had that sense. The spirit of the Lord says, you blame me too much. Stop it. He basically spanked me. There was nothing wrong with the bike. I didn't get hurt at all. It was just like a reminder. Who am I? You're God. Who are you? I'm nothing. Okay, good. We've got an understanding. <laughs> Shut up. Seriously. Anybody here ever go through anything like that? I did. I learned. Great haircut, Jesus. It's just one. Oh, I love it. No, I, I learned. And it takes time to learn these things, you know. And, and there's this sense that the Lord wants to do a work in us that we need to just wait. But there are times that we wait with perseverance. We go through these things. And so as we're doing so, a third thing here, he speaks of the spirit helping our weaknesses. The groaning of the spirit. He, he, are, he intercedes for us in what is called unarticulated speech. That's because he knows our human condition. He lives within us and is aware of us and our weaknesses. You see, even after salvation, we can continue battling the inclinations of the flesh. A desire to live right. A desire to give away your faith. A desire to serve God. A desire to speak the truth. All of these things are things that your, your natural man, the, the, the old way of life, didn't necessarily foster. Because in my old nature, I, I do things quite the opposite. So I need the Holy Spirit to work within me, even though I continue battle the, battling these inclinations. So the Holy Spirit does. He says in verse 26, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. We, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. And that's true. There are times when, when, when I'm not exactly sure, God, what, what am I supposed to be praying for? I don't know. How do I pray for this? How do I, what do I lift up? What spirit What's the attitude of my mind to be like? What, I, what am I to ask for? There have been times when I've, I've walked in and somebody is dying. And I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say, Lord, give them long life. Take them out of that bed because perhaps God wants to do a miracle. And then there are other times at the same time, really, that I'm thinking, but what if the Lord just wants to bring them home? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit who's within me does. And he makes these groanings that are unutterable because he knows, he knows what is right. And then there are times, that as much as I would like to pretend I have confidence every time I pray, there are times I simply don't know. That's why it says in verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God searches the hearts of his children. He intercedes for us. He knows our exact needs. Why? Because, and this I want to give to you before you leave, because this is going to take some time for some of us to learn, but I'll say it this way. Because he loves you and he wants the best for you no matter what. And I am telling you, it takes a long time in your walk with God to finally rest in that. I am telling you, and some of you know what I mean. Sometimes you think you know better than God and you want to tell God exactly his business, what you should do. This is what you should do. Heal my mom. Heal my dad. Why'd you take... When my father went home to be with the Lord, I sat in front of his house and I wept like a baby. Wept like a baby. And I said, Father... I said, my dad was a good man, and there are men out there right now who don't care for their wife, who are alcoholic or drug addicts or are vicious to their children. They are not good people. You allow them to live, and you took a good man. I don't understand it. And the Lord said, shut up. I know what I'm doing. And he brought me to peace because he said this to me. He said, and, and I'm sorry, I don't want to be extra biblical, but this is kind of a personal thing. He reminded me through his word, 
I love your father. He would not want to come back. He's beholding my face. He doesn't want to come back. He's with me. Trust me. And I did. You know, father knows best. My dad's with you. Why would I bring him back? Why would I want him back in a place like this when he's beholding your glory? Why would I do that? I learned and I've learned to trust my father. He knows what is best. And here's the lesson that I'll close with. Because he loves you. He loves you. Took my daughter Corinne when she was a couple months old to the doctor. She had terrible fever. She was only a teeny baby. We took her to the doctor, emergency, and they said, this baby, when you bring her home, they gave her some baby aspirin. It should reduce her temp, but keep an eye on her and keep giving to her, you know, recording her temperature because if it goes back up, you have to put her in cold water. And I still remember we took my baby's temperature and it was like 104. We had to put her in the ice water, call it the ice water, the cold water. Turn on that water in that tub, fill that tub up. I had this little baby in my arms. And and Corinne's holding on to me and I take this sick little baby and I put her in that ice water and I held her with my hands so the water would bring her temperature down, right? I couldn't take her screams and I climbed in the water with her and I held her in the water. My father did that for me. He couldn't take my pain so he joined me in it. He loves me and he loves you. And that's why you can trust him, because he came from heaven to dwell with you, to take what you deserve so he could take you back to be with him where you don't deserve. That's the God that we serve, and that's why we can trust him.